Good afternoon. Welcome to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. We're here at the Nature Research Center inside the Daily Planet, inside our giant globe-shaped theater here. And I'm speaking with Dr. Roland Kays. You may have heard uh, yesterday there were some very big press releases from here at the museum and the Smithsonian and also in Ecuador. And it's gotten quite a lot of media attention because it's about the discovery of a brand new mammal. And surprisingly, it doesn't start in the jungles where this animal actually resides. The story begins in a museum. That's right, that's right. Here's a, a, a picture of, of, of the museums uh, that we have in natural history museums all around the world. We have these exhibits where we invite the public, you guys, to come check it out. But then, you know, in the basement over here on A level, we have uh, behind the scenes drawers of museum specimens. And this has, you know, skins and skulls of mammals, birds, dinosaur fossils, clam shells, um, fish, all sorts of different things. And those aren't in exhibits for the public to see. They aren't. They're, they're for scientists to use. Sometimes artists come in and use them. And actually, it, it's amazing to just go through and open the drawers and look at this stuff. And uh, I think it's great that our museum actually lets you guys do some of this in the Discovery Center here on the, uh, on the second floor. You can actually go in and open drawers and get a, get a feel for what it's like. But imagine some of these uh, museums like the Smithsonian and the Field Museum and even here where we have you know, rows and rows and rows of cabinets. And this, this is where this story begins. It starts with going through these specimens, looking at old, decades old, sometimes hundreds of years old specimens that were collected a long time ago in places far away. And at first, we were just reviewing the Olingos. We wanted to see, well, how many species of Olingos are there? These are some animals that we already knew about. Yeah, that what are, is an Olingo? They're related to raccoons. They look kind of like the Olinguito. They're a little <laughs> bit bigger. Um, and, and when we were doing that, Chris, Chris Helgen, the lead author, he realized that every once in a while, he found just a couple in a couple museums, like in Chicago, totally different. Red, totally different skulls, totally different teeth. And that is what led us to then go to Ecuador ourselves and see if we could find this animal still alive. That's very cool. And that brings up, you just brought up a couple interesting things. That one is that, like many research projects, this was the work of more than one person. Yeah, we had a big team of people working on the, on the specimens, working in the field, doing the mapping work, doing genetic work. So, but, so it started with he, he recognized, and other people had recognized, possibly recognized without taking it to the next level, uh, maybe there's been some specimens in zoos in the past, and maybe some people had seen this, but they, what, they didn't? carry through with the Right, talk. so as we were going through and, and, and looking at every specimen that existed, there was one in New York in a museum that had a little scribble in there by an old curator that was something to the effect that, that he recognized that this was probably a new species, but he never followed through on it. And um, later we realized that there was actually an animal in a zoo that uh, was an Olinguito, and the zookeepers realized that it was different and they were frustrated because it wouldn't breed with any of their other Olingos. And now we know the reason that it wouldn't do that is because it wasn't that she was just picky, but uh, she was a totally different species. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, okay, so that's really interesting. So Chris, though, uh, did more than just recognize it. He decided to pursue it further. Right, right. So we followed through and we looked at almost every specimen in the world that we could find um, in, in the museum. Why did he call you? In, well, how did you get involved? Well, so I had done, before he got started on this, I had done work in the field with Olingos in Panama. And Olingos are pretty obscure. There's not very many people that study them like I'm kind of the only one. So it really? sort of made me the world's expert in Olingos at the time. And I was the only one who had actually been in the field and knew these animals in the wild, knew what they were doing. And so he started, he knew I'd be interested and I was super interested in what he had been finding. And so we decided together to plan a trip to Ecuador and see if we could still find the animal, see if we could get some fresh DNA samples to really, you know, update the study. And that's when we also involved Miguel Pinto, who's the key collaborator from Ecuador uh, in the work. Helps to have someone there too. Yeah. And uh, as far as we know, are they, are they only found in Ecuador? Ecuador and Colombia. And, uh, and we, we were able to map out where we think they're found. And I'll show you a picture of them here. This is the Olinguito. Um, so this, this one here is, is a lowland Olingo, not the new species. Um, and this is the Olinguito. It, it's got much longer fur. Uh, it's reddish and, and tinged black. And the amazing thing about this picture is this was on the internet before we did our study. And when we were looking where to go in Ecuador, we were, you know, Googling a lingo in Ecuador and seeing what we could find. And this was a picture taken by a bird watcher named Mark Gurney at a bird watching lodge named Tandipata. And um, 
we looked at this picture. We're like, that's the new species. That's the Olingito. It said Olingo. Like it the, said Olingo. The person thought it was an, identified it as an Olingo. Exactly. But you so, saw it was a... So this Olingito was, was lurking out there on the internet, and it yeah. just took our, sort of a trained Olingo-trained eye, an Olingo expert, Olingoologist, and to recognize that. And similarly, since your press announcement yesterday, I, I guess other things have surfaced. Like there's a video that popped up on YouTube yesterday. There's, there's a video. So that'll be, now it's the first video of the Olingito that's on YouTube that was taken in 2005. I think it might be this exact same animal. It was oh, really? at the same bird lodge it looks like it's in the same tree i think this particular olinguito is is like are they really rare like is that one of the other reasons why it's been unrecognized as a new species for a, a different species for so long is it is it that it's that rare is it well it's, it's secretive in it, its it ways? is it's very secretive yeah. so how rare it is we don't know it has a pretty small range only in the certain habitat this cloud forest habitat in two countries um so pretty small range but the thing is it only comes out at night and it's way up in the trees, and in this cloud forest, it's cloudy out. So when you go out at night, especially with a headlamp, and you try to look up to try to try to see what's in the trees, there's always there's often clouds going by. So it's just it's it's, it's it is hard to find, and uh, and so we don't know exactly how rare it is. We weren't able to get density estimates or anything like that. So that's some some more work we need to do to see well how many animals are there out there. And in general, the the idea of discovering new species, I was impressed. Uh, I'm new to the relatively new to the museum world, and to find that so many of our scientists have been involved in the discovery and the describing of, that's what scientists say when they describe a new species, they formalize the, the discovery. And um, even our, our paleontologists have discovered new dinosaur species. Um, by new, we just mean formally unknown or undescribed. And uh, of course, in the insect world, it's very common. New species are always being discovered. It's not so common for a mammal uh, well, no, so mammals, not, mammals, you know, every year there's usually one or two. Usually it's a rat or a bat. There's just a really cool bat discovered in South Sudan, a cool black and I'm white I'm glad you bat. didn't say a really cool rat. <laughs> <laughs> a cool bat, I'll Do go a mammologist. Uh, yes. Yeah, you know, okay. So, uh... So maybe one a year or so? Yeah, something, and, something, something along, along those lines. But car, this is a carnivore. It's in the order carnivore. It's a raccoon. Remember the raccoon family? There hasn't been uh, uh, anything like this in 35 years in the Western Hemisphere. And interestingly, the last one was a, a weasel discovered in this same habitat, in this cloud forest habitat. So I think there's reason to expect that there could be more secret animals hiding out in this cloud forest habitat. And it shows how special this type of place is. And, and interestingly, so uh, the Olinguito is, uh, is, you call it a carnivore because it's a member of carnivora. Right, right. But that doesn't mean all the members of carnivora actually are meat eaters. That's right. So that would be kind of like if your last name was carnivore, but you were a vegetarian. Um, it, it's in the group that, that includes, you know, bears and weasels and wolves and lots of things. That, so the, they name the order carnivora, but actually it eats fruit. So, so some a, species have evolved to go on to, to be fruit That's right. Eaters. So it evolved from the carnivores and uh, to take advantage of all the fruit. And in fact, we found this guy in a lot of fruiting tree, fruiting fig trees. So we would walk around in the forest um, and find where the figs were falling on the ground, some little green figs, some big green figs, these really cool giant red tomato-sized figs. And often we would look up there and see animals. We'd see um, olinguitos, but also kinkajous and these cool prehensile-tailed porcupines. So it was just a really cool forest with all these different fig trees, the sort of clouds blowing by, the moss, the, the giant fern trees that they have in this, and then porcupines, kinkajous, and olinguitos climbing around the trees. I know there's a subject you've written about previously uh, that you think that, that one of the roles the olinguito may play in the ecosystem is in seed dispersal. Can you explain what the significance of that is? Sure. So, so trees can't move. So if they need to find, uh, when they're, they're, they need to regrow to you know have the next generation of trees a lot of times they require animals to move their seeds around so as a fruit eater and as an animal that that runs we don't know how far they move per night but they move pretty far so they're able to eat the fruits and then you know what comes in must come out eventually and um and they, and they don't damage the fruit so they're not like a rodent that would chew and gnaw at the seeds so they eat the fruit they digest the pulp and then the seeds come out later and so this is important for the regeneration of the forest and interestingly you know in the last 24 hours since we made this announcement we begin lotting getting lots of pictures from people saying, hey, I think this is an Olinguito. You know, can you tell me, do you, do you think it is? And they tell us where it's from. And there was just one picture taken of a Olinguito eating a Cecropia fruit, which grows kind of right on the, on the edge of farms. And so it's interesting that we might be learning that these Olinguitos 
can move into sort of uh, uh, areas that need seeds from the forest to regenerate. And so they might help in the sort of restoration of forest habitats as well. And that's just a fascinating, fascinating part of evolution, that this mechanism that trees, which cannot move because they, they have their roots in this place, uh, the way they've done that fruits, that seeds actually work that way, that the fruit attracts something like an Olenguito. Well, it's a bribe. It's a bribe. So, so he gets to eat the fruit, but he carries the seed somewhere so that the tree can spread its territory. Exactly, yeah. Pretty yeah. interesting. And... Um, since it's so new, there must be a, is, there's very little known. Do we know how long, uh, how long does an Olinguito live? Or maybe an Olingo? How long does an Olingo live? Yeah, so Olingos can live um, 10 to 15 years in captivity. Uh, and so Olinguito is you know, possibly the same. There was that one in captivity. Actually, I, I don't know exactly how long it lives. I'd, I'd have to look that up. It's a long German manuscript. I haven't quite gotten through it all so yet. So since there's so much unknown, what do you want to know? So what's, what's next? What is it that you most want to know about the Olinguito? Well, so, so we, we, we think it's only, so it's only in the trees, only out at night, eats a lot of fruit. We want to know what else it eats. We want to know. It's got kind of pointy teeth, so we think it might eat insects and lizards and stuff like that. Um, the other really important thing is where does it live geographically? So we were able to build these models that predict where the animal is based on the few specimens that we do have, characterize the climate, the, uh, the forest type, and then predict, okay, well, based on these, this is where else we think it lives, but we don't know if they're there or not. And so really going to some of these areas and verifying are they there or not will help us. It could dr dramatically expand the range of the Olinguito, or it could contract it, depending on what we find. And that's important for you know, assessing the conservation status of the species. That's actually towards something I wanted to ask you, what, what role you played in the research. And that's some of what you did is like, Detailed description of where you have found it already. Right. So and we did predicting some, where you might. F so we call look this for uh, distribution modeling, where we, we we take the dots where we know the animal was. We look at a whole bunch of different map layers in the computer that looks at what the rainfall and the dry season and the temperature and the elevation and the forest type, and then we, we we predict based on that where it was. So that was that was one of the parts that I did. Once we got back from the field, there was kind of one team that worked on the genetic stuff and one team that worked on the mapping stuff. So this is very exciting and everything, but I mean, is it a big deal? Like, so what if it's not an Olingo? So what if it's an Olinguito? Does it matter? Well, it does for these forests. These are um, special places, these cloud forests, and they have a lot of species that live in the cloud forest and nowhere else. And the Olinguito is the latest example. There's some other pretty amazing ones, like the spectacled bear is, an, is another really cool creature that lives only in South America in these cloud forests. And another really mysterious one, one of my favorites, called the mountain kawadi, um, that uh, we know almost as little as we do, do, do about the Olinguito. But, um, and it's sort of, I think it's, it emphasizes the importance of these special forests and the need to protect them against uh, cutting, logging. Oh, is, is the Olinguito's habitat threatened? It is in some areas. So there's some areas that are preserved and some areas that are not. And, um, and a lot of the area is privately owned. And so, uh, um, you know, not under government, not, not officially parked or something like that. So, you know, the future of those areas is uncertain. And that's why we really want to promote and, you know, make people care about the Olinguito and the forest that they live in. And in fact, people can, in a way, contribute to its protection. Uh, and also acquire a cute stuffed animal. That's right. So this is our, <laughs> our stuffed animal uh, uh, that we had made in Ecuador, and, and proceeds from the sale of this will go towards Fundacion Otanga. Otanga is the, for, the forest that we worked in. And so working, you know, pr particularly in this bit of forest to help buy some land, and they're also do, doing some restoration in uh, old farm fields trying to regrow the, the, the forest as well. And so, so we're trying to do our, our, our little part, uh, raising the profile and also hopefully selling some of these guys. So we sold out in like five minutes in the store, but we have more coming. So if you want to put your name on the list at the, at the store, we'll be getting some more up from Ecuador very soon. So that's here in the, uh, in the museum stores, or uh, I think you can maybe order it through naturalsciences.org. You might be able to contact us and contact the, uh, if you're here, the you museum should, store. Yeah, that's right. There's a phone number there on the web. You can call and get, get your name on the list. Okay, because I heard there's a hot item, then you can not only have the cute animal, but you can also help support their, uh, the protection of their habitat. So, uh, what else, so in, in just concluding, well, what would you really like us to take away from this, uh, knowing about the Olinguito or about the scientific process and, and, and what, what's, what you're going to sure. be well, doing two, next? Two main points. One, we just talked about the, the importance of the cloud forest and the sort of amazing forest and amazing animals that live in this forest um, in, in the Andes. 
just like rainforest up in the mountains, just full of really cool life. And the other point, I think, is, is back to the beginning of where this discovery started, which was in museum collections. And it's the importance of, of having these collections, these natural history collections, recording you know, what the world was like in, in 100 years ago. And also, to we have to keep you know, contributing to them to, and keep collecting and reporting, you know, what is North Carolina like today so that we can make comparisons in the future as well. Excellent. Yeah, and it's not that unusual because we actually had a, f a fly species discovered through the collections here, right. also through the yeah, biodiversity. And if you look in our lab, you can see us working on, on some of the insect specimens. We also have the uh, flesh-eating beetles that are cleaning up our mammal skeletons that will be going into the mammal collection. So you can see that all in the biodiversity lab on the second floor. If people want to keep uh, up, uh, up with what's going on, is there any resource online that they can check in and, and, and yeah, find sure. out well, they, what's they going on? Yeah, sure. They can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I'll, it's, Roland, it's at Roland Kays. And, uh, and Roland we'll, Kays? Yeah. And apparently, there's now like... 10 Olinguito Twitter uh, <laughs> logins too, but don't, I mean, you can follow them too. I'm sure there'll be some interesting Some of them are kind of funny, I think. Yeah. Uh, but thank you very much, Dr. Roland Kays, our guest, and uh, find out more at naturalsciences.org and at Roland Kays on Twitter. Great. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks.